Well, it has been said by many, and who am I to argue with the many, that uh, chapter 11 is the most difficult chapter in the book of Revelation. Now, <clears throat> you can argue about that, I guess, back and forth, uh, but let's just go with it and say it is the most difficult <clears throat> chapter in the book of Revelation. And as you, you think about what Brian read, you know, we have this, this temple and, and John's told to measure the thing and we've got all these nations trampling on the church and we've got all these d time periods in there and then we've got uh, uh, prophets with fire coming out of their mouth and all sorts of weird things. How are we supposed to interpret that and how are we supposed to know what all that means and, and what on earth does it mean for us in our daily lives and then you'll remember we have to uh, sort of discover what on earth it meant to those first century churches to whom this letter was originally written. So we're going to attempt to uh, find out this morning uh, how we can uh, know what uh, John is trying to tell us here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you some keys or some secrets, if you will, to understanding. And, but we're going to start with a broader context. We're going to start with the Bible as a whole. What is the secret to understanding the Bible? Well, it's reduced to its uh, simplest form. The Bible is a book. It's a piece of literature. Now granted, it's authored by the Holy Spirit. It's supernaturally inspired. But it was, it's a book given to us. It's God revealing himself to us so that we might understand. Now, surely God is not going to reveal himself to us through something we cannot understand. So we are equipped to understand this book or we can at least equip ourselves with the help of the Holy Spirit to understand this book. What do we have in a piece of literature? Now, we have different kinds of literature, don't we? Uh, and we interpret it differently, don't we? For instance, uh, in, within the Bible, there are many smaller books and there are many different genres of literature. There's, there's narrative, there's uh, didactic, there's poetic, there's apocalyptic. And when we read those, we, we believe in literal interpretation, but you interpret them differently, don't you? For instance, in poetic literature, when we read poetry, we don't interpret poetry as we interpret historical narrative, do we? Because one is dealing with facts, one is dealing with what we call poetic license. Uh, so, for instance, in the Psalms, when David said, I cried so much I made my bed to swim. Well, we know what he means. He meant he cried a lot. It, he doesn't mean that his bed literally floated. And that's the same way we do when we interpret pop apocalyptic literature. We interpret it literally, but we have to interpret it symbolically and get the meaning behind the symbols. So that's, that's what we've been doing and that's what we will continue to do. You remember we've talked along the way about scripture interpreting scripture. And one of the, the, the biggest detriments to understanding the book of Revelation is people oftentimes want to start there rather than getting a firm grounding and a firm understanding of the Old Testament. Because there's, there's nothing new in the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation is simply bringing out what has already been said uh, in the Old Testament and the, and the New. And it brings it all to a head and to a conclusion. So the key to understanding the book of Revelation is that it is a letter. It's another piece of literature, isn't it? It's a letter written to seven real churches populated by very real people with cares and concerns the same as we have. Now, they were under a lot more persecution than we are because by God's grace, we live in a country uh, where we aren't physically persecuted uh, for being Christians. But we still have some of the same uh, problems. And now we come to this chapter, this 11th chapter, and, and if it's the most difficult chapter in what some would say is the most difficult book in the bigger difficult book called the Bible, how are we going to work our way through it? The secret to chapter 11 is to understand that it is a letter about us. 
the church depicted in understandable symbols. Okay. So all these symbols, these prophets spewing fire out of their mouth or witnesses, that's all going to become understandable to us because it's all rooted in the Old Testament. So if we know our Old Testament well, we will be able to recognize what John is trying to say. Another reason I think 11 is so difficult, though, is because it does talk about us. You notice the chapter of this message, it's all about us. And you've oftentimes heard me uh, come with the other quote, it's not all about you. It's all about God. But chapter 11 is all about us. It's all about the church. In chapter 11, 1 through 13, we are shown the entire path, the entire history of the church, its past, its present, and its future. And it's all laid out for us in uh, little snippets, if you will, vignettes or video clips, you may call them. And we're going to take a look at some of these as we go through. So let's begin... And the first thing we see about the church, remember this is about the church, that's us, is the spiritual protection through the ages. Uh, someone once said one of the greatest miracles of all times is that we still have a Bible. And you know, there's, if you read your history, there's never been a book that's been so attacked and has been tried to be destroyed so many times in so many ways by so many various uh, dictators and kings and so on and so forth. And yet here it is. It's still the number one best-selling book in the world. That's, that's a literal miracle. That's amazing. That shows us that God's hand of protection is on his people. It's on his church. It's on his word. And in the first verse here we see that John is given a measuring rod like a staff and he's told, rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and those who worship there. Whoa, what's this all about? Uh, I've read books where they try to recreate and measure and well one of these days we're going to rebuild this temple and he's given John the, the parameters that it's going to, to be and, and so on and so forth. That's not the point at all. What are we doing here in chapter 11 that we started in chapter 10? We're, we're enjoying an interlude, aren't we? You remember? Uh, remember back when we started in? Uh, we, we had the end of chapter 6 and history would come to its culmination. Judgment Day had come. And the, at the very end of chapter 6, what do we read? Who can stand before the wrath of the Lord? Well, see, John is at his wit's end. He says, what can we do? And what happens in chapter 7? God says, we're going to have an interlude before we go on. And he shows John how he's going to protect the church. He shows John that those who put their faith in Jesus Christ are the ones who will be able to stand at the judgment day and no one else. And you remember how he characterized the, the church, his people there? There was 144,000, and those are the martyrs, and then there was this great multitude that nobody could number. And that's how he characterized us, the church, in chapter 7. Well now, when we came to the end of uh, chapter 9, we had the same thing. Again, we'd gone through the cycle of time, we'd come to the end, we'd come to Judgment Day, and still... God has vested all these terrible calamities on the earth and still they don't repent. That's the end of chapter 9. So God says, okay, let's take another break here. Another interlude in the unfolding of these events before the final judgment. And he says, I'm going to show you how I'm going to protect my church. Now, you'll remember in uh, chapter 7, he put a seal on them, didn't he? He sealed them so that... They couldn't be harmed spiritually. So you all have a seal on you if you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Now I have one on me. I can't see yours. You can't see mine. But they are there. We're sealed up as, until the day of redemption when God will take us home to be with him. So we're okay. We're safe. So John is told to measure this temple now. And, and the temple represents the place of refuge. The place where those that know Jesus Christ are safe because who dwells in the temple? God. That's where God dwells, right? Symbolically. 
God is in the temple. And if you can get to the temple, you're safe. You're in God's presence. And so he says to John, he says, measure this temple. He's not talking about a physical temple. Uh, sometimes you can read books or hear messages about how one day the temple is going to be rebuilt in Jerusalem, a physical temple. Well, Falderaw. I don't, I don't know how you can come to that conclusion if you read your Bible. See, nowhere in the New Testament, and, and I challenge, I'll challenge you, read your New Testament, it's a good, good opportunity to read the whole thing. Not one place in the entire New Testament is there a mention of a physical temple being rebuilt. Nowhere. See, it's just not there. So we are not talking about a physical temple. We're not talking, sometimes these same books will talk about the reinstitution of the priesthood and the, the reinstitution of the sacrifices and so on and so forth. But my goodness, if that's going to happen, that actually demeans the sacrifice of Christ. Because you, you read in, in Hebrews, in chapter 10, verse 12, and what do we find? Speaking of Jesus, having offered one sacrifice for how long? For all time, he sat down at the right hand of God. We don't need any more sacrifices. We'll never need any more sacrifices. Christ offered one sacrifice for all time. It's interesting if we would jump ahead to chapter 21 of Revelation. And what do we see there? We, we see the end of time has come, uh, judgment is done, and we see the new Jerusalem coming down from heaven. Right? Okay. And we see all these things that are there. What's not there? It's a temple. Read Revelation chapter 21. No more temple. No more temple. So, to say the temple is going to be rebuilt is not a very good hermeneutics. You remember Revelation is a book of symbols? Well, what then would the temple symbolize here? We, we talked about it symbolizing a, a place of protection for God's saints, and, and it is. But how are we going to know for sure? Well, you remember our, our little hermeneutical principle that Scripture interprets Scripture. And now, where will we go then to find out? Well, we'll go to Scripture. We'll go to the New Testament. And we, the, the, the fellow that is pinning these words is John. And John wrote the Gospel of John. So we might want to go there and see how the word temple is used in his Gospel. And when we get there, if we would go to chapter 2, verse 19, Jesus himself is speaking. Now, if anybody has a pretty good handle on what means what in this book, I would say it's Jesus. Jesus says this, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will rebuild it. Now, what is he referring to? His body. Oh. And what did the Jews think he was referring to? The literal temple. You see, but he was not. Because the literal temple was no longer the dwelling place of God. Jesus was God. He was dwelling among men. People. His body was the temple. Okay, Jesus is pretty good. How about Paul? I wonder how Paul would use this word. You know, Paul is the consummate theologian, right? He's the guy that kind of extrapolates on, on all these uh, pithy little things that Jesus said. So if, if we look over here in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, we'll, we'll see how Paul uses this. He says, Do you not know that you are God's temple? And that God's Spirit dwells in you. If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him, for God's temple is holy, and you are that temple. Get the point? He repeats himself, doesn't he? You are God's temple. Hmm. Interesting. 
Over in chapter 6, verse 19, Paul repeats himself again. Do you not know that you are God's temple? God dwells within you. The Holy Spirit dwells within you. You are the temple. In Ephesians chapter 2, verses 19 through 21, still Paul, So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation... Now notice we're using building terms here again. Built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. Now when we see a phrase like Jesus is the cornerstone, we don't interpret that that okay Jesus is some kind of a brick here that goes in the corner of a building. And, no, we wouldn't think of that. So how come when we get to Revelation all of a sudden we, we try to say well, well this has got to be you know a real temple. No. It's not. It's not at all. How about Peter? Let's get one more opinion. Just in case Jesus and Paul aren't good enough for us, we'll, we'll check with Peter and see if he, he concurs. Chapter 2, verses 4 and 5. As you come to him, Jesus, a living stone, rejected by men, but in the sight of God chosen and precious, you yourselves, like living stones, are built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in Scripture, Behold, I am laying a stone in Zion, a cornerstone, chosen and precious. Now again, when we read these words, do we think we're a bunch of little rocks? Or little bricks? No. We know what he's talking about. Let's apply the same hermeneutic to the book of Revelation and our apocalyptic literature. Christ is the cornerstone of the temple. Without him, the thing collapses. Okay? He's the guy that's holding it all up. And we, his redeemed people, are all the various little bricks. And he keeps adding to those bricks. And we keep building this spiritual temple. So here, measuring of the temple represents simply God's place of protection. All of us that are part of that temple are spiritually protected. Well, you say, then how come if God does such a good job of protecting the church over the years, how come the church has suffered so much? Well, let's see what we can find out. Second point, persecution through the ages. Let's look at verse 2. Here's what he says. But do not measure the court outside the temple. Leave it out. For it is given over to the nations and they will trample the holy city for 42 months. The nations. Who are these nations? They're going to trample the holy city for 42 months. The holy city, the temple, us, the church, they're going to trample on us for 42 months. Who are these people? They are simply the unredeemed. The outer court is theirs. They're not invited into the inner court. They're on the outer court. Now, Revelation uh, chapter 5, verses 9 and 10. And they sang a new song, saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and open its seals. For you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God, from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have made them a kingdom of priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. You see, we are redeemed out of the nations. See? Out of the nations. Or as Paul puts it, we've moved from darkness into light. And Christ is our cornerstone. 
The unredeemed are on the outside. So, in the New Testament, you have two groups of people. You have the nations and the redeemed, God's people. In the Old Testament, you had the same thing. You had the nation Israel and the nations. Two groups of people. You always have two groups of people. God's people, and it's not good English, but God's people and not God's people. Those are the two groups. Again, some folks like to throw in a third and say, well, now what we're going to have here is God's people and a redeemed Israel, and they're kind of a special little group of God's people. It's not in the New Testament. You have God's people and not God's people. Well, what will they do? They will trample God's people. The church will be persecuted. We've, we've talked about this as we've gone along. Jesus himself made it very clear that we will have tribulation in this world. Now, Jesus said to his apostles, you know, just as the world has hated me, so it will hate you. And the reason for that is because of the message we bring, the witness of the church. Now, we've tried very hard uh, for all the right reasons, but I think we've been wrong in, in the last 50 years or so, of making the church a comfortable place for non-Christians. Now, I say we've, we've done that for all the right reasons. We want to reach people. We want them to be comfortable. But you know what? The gospel is not comforting to the unbeliever. It is confronting to the unbeliever. It is confrontational. It challenges them. It says you are a sinner. And the only way out for you is to accept Jesus Christ. I had a friend. He's now gone to be with the Lord. He was an elder in one of the largest churches there in Vancouver. Fantastic guy. But he tried to convince me that we should not, we didn't have that cross then, we had a different cross, that it should come down. Because when non-Christians come in, they don't need to see that. It needs to look like any other building they would go into, a movie theater or a store or whatever. No. It needs to look like a place where the gospel is expounded. And the gospel is this. You're a sinner outside of Christ. Your destination is hell. And there's no way around it except through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, you say, but if I say that, I'm going to suffer ridicule. I'm going to uh, be laughed at. I'm going to be mocked. I may even be shunned by my little group. Yes, you may. That's the answer. Yes, you may. But that's what we're called to do. Now, there are ways to do it. You know. But if you do stand up for the gospel, you will suffer some form of ridicule. And therefore... We don't do it. I don't do it enough. You don't do it enough. Because we don't want to suffer the consequences. And I'm riding the same boat with you guys. I'm preaching to myself just as much as you. Don't. So. But that's what, that's why the nations will trample the church. But now you can take comfort in the fact with all the trampling they've done, all those people through the ages, they're all dead and gone. Church is still here. The church is doing just fine. You know, now we say, oh, but we need to grow more, and we do. You know, we, we need to do more outreach, and we do. All those things are true. But we're right where God wants us. And if, if he tarries another 2,000 years, 2,000 years from now, the church will be doing just fine. He'll be right here, trucking right along. And you remember, God is dead. 
Well, that was a big movement for a while, except all those folks died. <laughs> I don't understand. Church is still here. The church will be persecuted. I, I, I was introduced to a, a, a figure I hadn't heard of before, and as I'd done some research on him, I, I don't know why I'd never heard of him, but you, you ever hear of a guy named uh, Sergei Kordikov? I, I never had either, uh, but I was listening to Art Arzurdia preach, and, and he mentioned him, and mentioned his book. He's written a book called uh, Forgive Me, Natasha. And uh, I've, I've got the book ordered because now I'll have to read it, so I'll let you know. But anyway, Sergei Gordikov was a, in the 70s, was a, a Russian a sailor uh, who moved into the KGB because he was a bright young guy moving up. And their assignment was to persecute the church. He's been referred to as the 20th century Paul. Uh, and what they would do is they, would, they met in house churches at that time in Russia because there was everything was screwed down pretty tight and they would go to these house church meetings and literally beat the people there you know, beat them bloody with clubs and stuff and uh, he went to this one meeting and there was this young girl there named Natasha I don't know how old she was 17 18 19 and anyway they beat her half to death and then not too long later he was going to raid another church meeting and she was there and they beat her again and the third time he went to another church meeting, he was there, and he beat her again. And to use his words, they beat her legs until they looked like hamburger. So that's a pretty bad deal. But later on, as he got to thinking about that, he accepted Christ. And he accepted Christ because that young woman was so committed to serving Jesus Christ that you couldn't beat her out of it. And that so impressed him that he turned, just like Paul did. It's amazing. So I, I'm sure the book is going to be good. I'll, I'll let you know. Um, by the way, after becoming a Christian in 1971, I believe it was, he came to the United States. And the way he got here was his ship was up in Canadian waters, and I don't remember how far off the coast it was, but anyway, he jumped from the ship into the ocean and swam to shore, and that's how he deserted, got to Canada, came to the United States from there, and began uh, telling about the things that went on in Russia. Well, in 1973, he was on vacation, and mysteriously, a bullet went through his head. And nobody knows just how that happened. There's theories. But the, the strongest one is the KGB got him. And they probably did. So he gave his life, this young woman just about gave her life, all for the sake of the gospel. Now, how does what we risk stack up? I don't know. I think we've got the better end of the deal. The church will be persecuted. And by the way, nowhere in the New Testament does it tell us that we're going to be spared from tribulation. There, there's, it doesn't talk about some rapture coming along and, and we go off and have a jolly old good time in heaven while God beats up everybody here on earth. No. It says we will have tribulation. John, when he pens this book in the first chapter, says, describes himself as what? Your fellow partaker in tribulation. You see? It's going on now. Jesus, in his great high priestly prayer, high priestly prayer, in John chapter 17, verses 16, 15 and 16, says, I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. See? He doesn't ask God to protect us from physical harm. Now we can ask him for that. It's a valid thing to do. That's fine. But what he asks the Father to do for us is keep us from the evil one. That spiritual protection. You see, Satan can't touch us spiritually. He can beat us up all day long. But that's all he can do. 
You remember last week, I gave you a little ditty that I, I stole this from Azurdia too, but I'm quite confident he stole it from somebody else, so it's okay. That's what we preachers do, you know. <laughs> steal a little bit here, a little bit there. And, and the way you steal a guy's quote, by the way, if you want to steal a quote, you, you do it this way. The first time you use it, you say, well, Rick Warren says, whatever. And then you, after a while you say, well, it's been said, whatever. And then, well, I've always said, anyway, that's how you do it. It's, it's a progression thing. So I stole this from Art. He probably stole it from somebody else. You remember we said this, to be a follower of Jesus Christ is to be a witness to Jesus Christ. And if you're a witness to Jesus Christ, in some sense or another, it will result in you becoming a martyr for Jesus Christ. That's good news, huh? That's what you wanted to hear. How about uh, Romans chapter 8, verse 36? For your sake, for Christ's sake, Paul's talking, we are being killed all day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. More good news. And in one sense or another, if you stand up and witness for Jesus Christ, you will become a martyr for Jesus Christ. Now again, because of the blessings of geography, we won't probably lose our lives physically. But you remember the seven churches? Remember some of them were excluded from employment because they stood up for Jesus Christ? That may happen. Some of them were barred from buying and selling in the marketplaces. They couldn't engage in commerce because of their witness to Jesus Christ. That could happen to us. Probably not, but it, it's, it could. But be of good cheer because we are guaranteed the victory because of Jesus Christ. Okay. That's ours and it can never be taken away from us. Notice the next verse in Romans, verse 37. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him and loved us. And then Paul goes into his great laundry list that nothing can separate us from the love of Jesus Christ. Now, one note of encouragement here, the persecution is limited. Notice, they'll trample the holy city for 42 months. How long is 42 months? Three and a half years. Now, we'll jump ahead a little bit. Uh, verse 3, And I will grant authority to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy for 1,260 days. How long is that? Three and a half years. So what's with this three and a half year thing? Half yeah, it is half of 70. It's another symbolic period of time. It's the time from when Christ came to earth until Christ closes out history. It's the time of tribulation between the two comings of Jesus Christ. And between those two comings, the Gentiles will be able to trample the church. But they will never be able to spiritually defeat it. Christians, we're here for a reason, and that reason is to tell others about Jesus Christ. But I'm afraid, it's like a friend of mine who is a dentist over in Portland once said, we witness like we floss. Yeah. He says that he's been a dentist for years. And he says, it's amazing, the standard response to my question, how often do you floss? The most common answer he gets as people squirm in the chair. Well, not enough. Isn't that it? How often do you witness for Jesus Christ? Well, not enough. <laughs> Me too. I mean, I'm right there with you. I need to do better. 
But remember, whatever repercussions you suffer here on this earth for witnessing for Jesus Christ, there's going to be a day of reward. A day of reckoning in the good sense. In the best sense. When Jesus looks at you and says, good job. Good job. You stood up for me. And now, I'm going to stand up for you. Pretty good trade-off, I would think. Pray with me. Lord Jesus, thank you that you are God and that you have made us your people. That you chose us. That you selected us individually before the foundation of the earth and determined to call us into your kingdom. And yet you tell us to place our faith in you. And so we have, O oh God. And yet it's difficult. It's hard for us because we're still of the flesh. Uh, we still feel the, the stings and jabs of people talking about us and thinking we're weird. And so, Lord, empower us. Fill us with your spirit. Lord, let us rise above all these things and tell the world about you and the great salvation you offer to all. And Lord, as we go to your communion table when we do as the book of Revelation does, and we look back, we look at the present, and we look at the future, Lord, help us to examine ourselves, as your word says, to look and see that there's nothing in us that would cause us to be unworthy, and if there is, that we deal with it right now on the spot, give it to you, and therefore be reunited with you. We ask these things in your name, Jesus. Amen.